There is no safe level of lead. I am declaring a state of emergency for the incorporated boundaries of the city of Flint, Michigan. This was probably our worst nightmare in the country. I'm sorry, government failed you. For two years, the people of Flint have been lied to, mistreated, and stripped of one of their most basic human needs. On April 25th, 2014, an emergency manager allowed water from the Flint River to flow through the maze of pipes underneath the city. In the beginning, the people were told the water was safe and they continued to use it to cook, clean, and drink. Soon after, it was deemed unsafe for human consumption, all the while never changing in quality. Two years after the switch, the water is still unsafe and there is still no solution in sight. I'm Trace Clinton. And I'm Jordan Bruns. In our first documentary, we broke down the process of how Flint came to what it is today. After its release, the story unfolded further, including the release of government emails, scandals, and increased support from people around the world. The Flint water crisis exploded within the media, leading to attention from the nation and the government. That attention led to action from all parties, protests and lawsuits from the people, investigations from the government, and firings and changes in staff among individual departments. But holding the spotlight for the longest has been the possible link between the Flint River water and the 12 deaths from the waterborne illness, Legionnaire's disease. Fingers have been pointed in all directions, but all the while, blame is being aside. People are still fighting every day just to find water to drink. It's important to remember that the reason people have been suffering for the last two years was based on a single decision that was meant to save money. Jordan Hancock will recap on the past two years. Flint's economy was at an all-time high, but people began leaving and taking their money elsewhere, which sent the city into a downward spiral of financial distress. With millions in debt, the state appointed an emergency manager. To cut costs, a decision was made to switch from the Detroit water to a more self-sufficient form of getting water to the city, the KWA pipeline. As a temporary water source, the Flint River added on a new heap of disaster. This was March of 2014. Starting September of that same year, problems began to arise because of the switch to the river water, starting with a boil water advisory and ending with the presence of lead. Michigan DEQ did not have a corrosion control plan that would have stopped most of the water contamination. The people were outraged and felt helpless. Literally, I could tell the day that the switchover hit my pipes because the moment that I took a shower, it would switch about every two days. One day, it would smell like straight river water, and the very next day, it would smell like you were swimming in a swimming pool. Finally, in October of 2015, Flint's Mayor Dane Walling announced the switch back to Detroit water, but that didn't stop the problem. It's going to take time for the Detroit water to move through the system, for our pipes to be healed, uh, for our families and our children who have been affected to be healed. E. coli, a bacteria found in water, was feared to be in the Flint water. To prevent any outbreaks, the city went to great measures to disinfect the water. TTHM, a byproduct of chlorine disinfecting of the Flint water, was found in alarming levels. Notices were sent out claiming that this was not at all an emergency. However, those with compromised immune systems were at risk for liver, kidney, and nerve damage. Lead in the pipes reacting with the corrosive chemicals in the water put traces of lead in the water. This causes many health risks for all ages, and the length of time a person is exposed to the lead determines how badly they experience the effects. You don't know um, when your child has lead poisoning. They're not usually going to complain of a headache or a bellyache or uh, they're going to have overt behavioral issues. Um, so when we screen for lead at the ages of one and two, usually we don't know. We don't know that they have lead poisoning. So they don't present with symptoms. So that's why we have to be vigilant and do the screening and be aware. The residents of Flint did not have safe drinking water. Children broke out in rashes when bathed. Cooking was done with bottled water and the bills were piling up for toxic water. It's been two years and the water is still affecting the people today. Flint is left with toxic, undrinkable water. For months after the switch, nobody really knew the problems with the water. It all started with Leanne Walters, a mother of four, who recognized the danger. Making sure the people get the help that they need. That's still not happening here on the ground and that is what is needed the most. Making sure that people are getting bottled water. There's a failure to make sure the shut-ins and the disabled and the homebound are getting the water in an appropriate amount of time. Making sure people's filters are installed, which they're still working on that, but we're so far into the game, we shouldn't still be working on those things. Kirk Ayet also became the first journalist to write about the water, sparking an explosion in media attention. 
We were all interested in getting to the truth and all worked cooperatively, very cooperatively, in order to achieve that goal. Alongside those two would be Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha from Hurley and Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech, who both worked to expose the lead contamination. Without these people, things could have been much worse. But the people of Flint are no stranger to hardship, from the never-ending crime to the outcries that never seem to be heard. For months of not knowing to having to swallow the hard truth, these families have learned to live with the lead, and they even had to pay to be poisoned. The Baker family is no stranger to tragedy, as are all the other families living in Flint. What makes their story even more of a heartbreak is Megan Baker's pregnancy throughout the timeline of the water crisis. My entire pregnancy, we were, we were living in Flint, and it was the entire time of, that we were on the Flint water system. 11% of the children living in the United States are affected from ADHD. But for the Baker's eight-year-old daughter, Piper, her sudden behavior issues have all eyes turned on the water. If you know anything about Piper, she is an extremely intelligent little girl. She was, went through testing early um, when she was four years old and they put her in school a year early because of how well she picked up and retained information. Um, so now her being in third grade, it doesn't really make sense to us as to why all of a sudden that would just go out the window. We don't know if it was predisposed or if she was born and this was meant to happen or if this was a cause of her environment and the lead in the water. With a new diagnosis, what is the right way to tell your child that something that they ingested is causing them a lifelong struggle? We have set her up with a therapist um, to see what we can do to benefit her to help get her back on track. Both her mother and her father, Chris, now face the struggle of explaining to their daughter her new disability. But what's the right way to do that? You know, how do you tell your kids there's something wrong with you and it's not your fault? Bringing home a new baby from the hospital is always very stressful on the parents. But what happens if even they are kept in the dark about the quality of their water? When we had our youngest, um, after we brought her home from the hospital, um, she developed a full body rash um, that didn't go away for quite a few weeks and we couldn't figure out why and when we took her to the doctor, they told us just to not give her quite as many baths. The daily struggle of the people in Flint has caught the nation's eye. Senator Bernie Sanders came to Flint to listen to the community voice their frustration. I lost twins in July of 2015 due to being poisoned. Um, both of my kids have tested positive for high levels of lead. My son has been suspended 56 times this year in school. He's in the first grade and he doesn't even want to attend school anymore. And now my mom is a nurse anesthetist. She works at McLaren Flint. She didn't know what was going on at the hospital and now people aren't trusting her. So I want answers. I want to know why my mom's getting blamed when she didn't know anything. I want to know why my peers can't even go home and drink and shower. Not only is the community emotionally and physically hurt, their wallets are beginning to feel a tug. Financially, this is just ridiculous. I mean, that could be a car payment or money that we were saving up for college funds or retirement funds or, you know, if the girls needed clothes or something like that. No, we had to pay, you know, one third of a mortgage payment for water. It's ridiculous. To think that we were causing more damage to our children. But really, the, the biggest and scariest thing is just not knowing. For almost two years, Flint families have had to deal with the unimaginable. All they want is the answer, and the answer is just one of the many things they can't get. The struggle wasn't just dealing with the lead. Next comes the testing. Endless pokes and prodding, results that take weeks to come back, not knowing when the next water pickup is, and wondering if that filter needed to be changed. Restless nights wishing for less confusion. The system for getting tested was error prone, and sometimes it was just ineffective. Haley Garrett has more on the lead testing process. Testing the water in people's homes is what revealed everything. 
Worried families like Leanne Walters demanded that the city test their water to figure out what was going on. Eventually, after her cries for help were not heard, she took matters into her own hands with the help of Virginia Tech. My average was 2,500 parts per billion. My highest was 13,500 parts per billion. Hazardous waste is 5,000. The government eventually set out officials to test the water. However, many guidelines were not followed. Therefore, the results were much lower than the reality and inaccurate. You remove the aerator the night before sampling, clean the lead out, so when you measure the lead the next day, the lead in water looks lower than it normally is. EPA wrote a memo that essentially banned that protocol. But they know, as we speak today, Water utilities still use that protocol. Regardless of the government's careless testing, the public was finally starting to be aware of the reality. There's lead in their water. Now the next question is, how badly was this affecting the health of Flint residents? With this question comes even more problems. Of course, Flint's parents' first priority was getting their kids and eventually their own blood tested for poisoning. Many families were just too late. Lead leaves the blood after about a month of being in the human body's system. It then moves to organs and bones in the body. This can cause many health problems, both mentally and physically. Once the lead leaves the blood, it is very difficult to test for the poison. The side effects of lead poisoning can take up to five years to show. All of these things make it seem like mission impossible to figure out who has been exposed to this poisonous substance. On top of the scientific problems of testing residents, there's also the problem of lack of staff. There's only one technician testing all of these blood samples at the county health department. We will take all these samples that we're collecting today mm -hmm. back to work tomorrow and I will run them all through my lead care to him. I have an assistant right now who is a temp that's actually drying the blood, but I do all the testing. Many clinics were only testing kids and all clinics testing blood were packed daily. Now all residents want is for the government to fix the problem and replace the pipes. However, deciphering the maze of water pipes throughout the city and figuring out which ones have lead is definitely a struggle. Dealing with old and inaccurate records has made finding where exactly the lead-filled service lines are extremely difficult. Lead in the pipes of the city in Flint could be in a couple different places. It could be in the water service lines that start here at the roads, and end up by the house. Or it could be in the water pipes and fixtures in the house itself. Both may need to be replaced. There's no easy way to fix this great tragedy. Flint residents have definitely been suffering and deserve a solution. Sadly, this crisis is going to take time and a great deal of effort to decipher the puzzle of how exactly the city should solve the problem. The long-term effects that rushed into the city are irreversible. The financial strain that the businesses in Flint feel and the trouble that comes from the fear of the water affect the city as a whole. The future of Flint's economy is uncertain, but no big changes are going to be made anytime soon. Alicia Paxton asked the people of Flint about the longer lasting effects of the crisis. The future of Flint is above all uncertain. Residents of the city have been dealing with rumors, lies, and a problem they did not create that has become their new normal. There is a lot of stress, you know, this whole city is stressed out. It's, it's always on your mind now, you know. For businesses, the concern about the water is real. You know, people are going to be concerned when they go out to eat, you know, how their food is getting washed and how it's being prepared and what, what's the source of that water. But for some businesses, things have been doing fairly good. Local restaurant Whitehorse Tavern has even said that business has gone up 12% for them. Realty has also been doing well, seeming unaffected by the crisis. It hasn't really slowed down the sale of houses here. Houses are still selling. Um, and uh, this is the spring season and listings are up. Uh, I mean, people still have to have somewhere to live, okay? Everybody can't get up and move out of the city. <laughs> A problem that is being faced for business is the expenses. It has cost thousands for filters and people are still left confused and unsure of the lead test. Signs being hung at businesses all around stating that they have drinkable water. Realtors are also concerned that in the future, banks will stop making loans for homes. But with Flint in the spotlight, that hasn't happened yet. Another issue that will be faced in the city's future is the health of the children who have been exposed to lead. What will be available for them in years to come? How many kids will start to show signs of being affected? The big thing is going to be what's going to happen to their babies. 
you know, what's going to happen to their children that have been drinking this water for the last year, eating it in formula, um, that have been bathing their kids in it. I've had <laughs> students that have babies that have had sores on their skin and lesions and health issues. So I don't know what's going to happen. That's my biggest concern is how are we going to prepare to take care of kids that have permanent brain damage from lead poisoning. These are extraordinary, uh, you know, circumstances. Uh, it would not be a problem. But when individuals are continually or repeatedly exposed to uh, relatively high lead levels like that uh, on things, it's where it really makes a difference like that. It's unclear what the problem has in store for the city in years to come. This is a long-term problem that needs a long-term fix. This is a problem of forever. People still have hope for the future. Solutions are slowly being found, the 30-day plan being put in place by the mayor, and the governor's most recent plan for a long-term solution. EPA coming out with tests showing the lead levels are indeed going down. No one knows if residents will ever put their full trust in the government again. Only time will tell. Where is the end, you know? I mean, where does it end? You know, will you, will you ever really, you know, um, uh, have any trust, you know, in government and, you know, the officials say the water is okay, but I mean, how long is it going to take us to, to really believe that, you know, to where we really feel comfortable? For months, the families in Flint were told the river water was safe while their own government was importing water to the state building just steps away from the river. Another misconception is that the river is actually the problem. But in reality, this is the healthiest the river has been in years. It's just the corrosion control that didn't happen. We said it from the beginning and we're saying it now that the river was a perfectly suitable source for drinking water. It just wasn't treated correctly. During the course of the Flint water crisis, there has been a lot of finger pointing and name blaming. Most able to testify for themselves. But in this case, one of the few blamed isn't even human. The Flint River, which is roughly 78 miles long, was the go-to when the emergency manager decided to switch off the Detroit Water and Sewage Department. The history of the Flint River gives it a bad rap, but according to Rebecca Fidoa from the Flint River Watershed Coalition, the river has new life. Specifically, we look at our what are called benthic macroinvertebrates, and so the, that's just a fancy way of talking about the bugs and insects that live on the, um, the rocks and the leaves and the branches in the river. There are some species that are really tolerant to pollution and there are some species that are really intolerant to pollution. And if we find a broad array of those species, so lots of biodiversity, then we know that the water quality in that stretch of the river is good and the habitat there is equally good because they need both. You need good quality water and you need really solid habitat. Not only is the water quality improving, but the habitat is as well. In the past, industries lined the stretch river from Flint all the way up to Saginaw. The most well-known industries on the river were GM and DuPont, but there also was a battery plant, paint manufacturer, coal gasification plant, and the production of soldering materials for GM cars. Regardless of all the past pollution that plagued the river, from industry or from natural causes, the river is actually the healthiest it's ever been. It's perfectly safe for recreational activities like canoeing and fishing, and there is no reason to be afraid of the Flint River. The testing that we've done has shown that this is a, a healthy system that's recovering. So we've been doing benthic macroinvertebrate testing since 1999, and now most of our scores are in the good to excellent range. So we know that the health of the river is it's great and it's trending up. After decades of using the Flint River water to produce their cars, GM stopped using the water in 2014. Due to how the water was now being treated, it was causing corrosion to the parts they were producing, which raised the question. If the river water was leaving rust on car parts, was it actually safe for consumption? The problem was the treatment of the water, or the lack thereof, and then the lack of response from all government agencies, from local all the way up to federal, uh, to, to ensure that safe drinking water was being delivered to area residents. Uh, but the water itself, and um, our, our friend from Virginia Tech is saying it now as well. The water itself is perfectly treatable water. Originally, the state response to the water crisis was quite slow until Rick Snyder, the governor of Michigan, announced that the state was at fault for what happened to Flint and said that he was taking responsibility for the crisis. Since then, Snyder has worked to fix the problem and send help, like the National Guard, into the community. Bailey Talaska has more on the state's response to the Flint water crisis. The state dragged its feet for seven months. For that reason, the state of Michigan's government is taking the most heat for the Flint crisis. Governor Snyder is being put in the hot seat for the problems in Flint because of how long it took him to respond. We want Governor Snyder to take accountability. Stop lying. 
Snyder downplayed the problems in Flint for a long time and had no choice but to get in the middle of the action at the beginning of this year when the media blew up the crisis. High lead levels and the growing amount of cases in Legionnaires was known by the state before it became public. The MDQ's job is to prevent problems like Flint's from happening. It's a memo from the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality to the Department, uh, the, um, the EPA, saying that, and this is dated February 27 of 2015, almost a year ago, indicating that Flint has an optimized corrosion control program. They did not. And the MGQ admits that they dropped the ball. So during the process in our conversations with the, with the local water treatment plant, with the uh, Environmental Protection Agency and the DEQ, we forgot that the outcome was clean drinking water. Now both the governor and MDEQ have apologized and are taking actions to fix Flint. I am sorry and I will fix it. No citizen of this great state should endure this kind of catastrophe. In March 2016, the state finally released a long-term plan for Flint. It includes getting more kids tested for lead poisoning and making sure all people have access to fresh food. He is also working closely with Flint's mayor on replacing all the lead pipes in Flint and getting the people of Flint jobs and their kids a good education. But many feel like Senator's actions are too little, too late. I think the people of Michigan expected truth, transparency, and accountability. The governor failed th that tonight. In addition to this new plan, the state has also been working on getting funding for Flint. Starting at the State of the State, Steiner gave $28 million to go towards helping Flint and was working on getting much more, including $37 million to work towards safe drinking water, and the state got $30 million to go towards helping the people of Flint with a portion of their future water bills, and Steiner's asked for $232 million with an additional $195 million, which have yet to see Flint. The majority of the state response only came after months of screaming citizens, independent lead testing, and an explosion of media attention. News outlets around the country rushed to Flint when they realized what was happening to the city. It wasn't long before the power of the media brought more than just worldwide attention. Suleiman Martarway has the story. For two years, the people's voices of Flint were crying out for someone to pay attention. Eventually, it happened. This all happened around the fall of 2015, once they announced lead was in the water. The national news coverage had started ramping up at that point. Major networks from around the world started to arrive. People like Rachel Maddow recognized the severity of the water problems and brought her show to Flint. One is that I feel like the people of Flint haven't gotten enough respect and uh, credit for having brought the nation's attention to what was going on here. The only reason that I cover this on my national news show is because the people of Flint scream their bloody heads off in order to get attention to this. And I feel like they need credit and they need respect and support for having done that. Political activists showed up like Reverend Jesse Jackson, who came to Flint multiple times and then led a march. Michael Moore also came, hoping to have Governor Snyder arrested and for President Obama to visit Flint. This, this town voted twice for President Obama and has asked nothing. We need, we need the President of the United States help. President Obama never came down to Flint, but he was only 60 miles away in Detroit at the height of the crisis. Michigan for a special CNN Democratic presidential debate. I'm Anderson Cooper. I want to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world. Although the president did not come down to Flint, but the presidential hopefuls did, hosting a debate at the Wyden Auditorium. Other celebrities have helped pitch in into the crisis, such as Eminem, Madonna, Jimmy Fallon, George Lopez, and Snoop Dogg. Other companies, such as Detroit Pistons, have pledged $25 million, and including Pepsi and Coca-Cola, have teamed up along with Meyer and Walmart. Now that people around the globe know about the problem, doesn't mean that it's fixed. The world is now yelling at our governor and our president to step in and help and do the right thing by us, and it's still not happening. I wanted the people of Flint to be on national TV demonstrating that they're living out of bottled water. The Band-Aid doesn't even work that well, but the problem's not getting fixed, and I felt like we needed to come here to show that. No, no, Flint is not alone. I'm here to tell you that Flint is not alone. People didn't know about it. People weren't here. You know, I was off for a year around the world making my movie. 
I came back to hear about this, and I just couldn't believe it. So, um, you know, don't, don't despair. More and more celebrities are helping Flint each day by donating money or water. Some schools even held water drives to help residents and schools in the Flint district. Due to all of the coverage, the federal government began talks about aiding Flint. Many people are beginning to ask for a change in the lead and copper rule. It has been shown that the rule was part of the reason for the crisis. Savannah Rowe and Robin Porter have more on what the federal government is and isn't doing about the crisis. The federal response to the Flint water crisis started off slow, but it picked up when the president came to Detroit on January 16th. And I know that if I was a parent up there, I would be beside myself that my kids' health could be at risk. That same day, the president declared a state of emergency in Flint. When he did, it freed up $5 million in federal aid for the city. This money was used for the much-needed water filters and other items to help the residents. The aid was capped at $5 million for the time being because it could not be declared a disaster. On March 25th, the federal response to the Flint water crisis was extended to August. On January 19th, the president met with Mayor Karen Weaver at the White House. He heard how Flint is dealing with the ongoing crisis and the challenges that face the whole city. The White House press secretary released the appointment of Dr. Nicole Lorry, Department of Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary, for preparedness and response. She would lead the federal response in Flint. On January 21st, the president gave $80 million in federal funding to repair the structure and make the water safe. The city hasn't received that federal funding yet. Presidential campaign candidate Hillary Clinton visited Flint. In her speech, she sympathized with the families she talked about supporting the city through the crisis. I will not for one minute forget about you or forget about your children. I will do everything I can to help you get back up. Like Hillary, Bernie Sanders visited Flint. Bernie held a town hall meeting to see what was going on. And to hear what is happening to the children in this community is so horrific, it is so painful, it is almost hard to discuss. Congress is also stepping in. Congressional hearings have been held to try to get to the bottom of the problem. On top of the hearings, Michigan senators are trying their hardest to get money to help Flint. Senator Debbie Stabenow and Senator Gary Peters are working on getting a bill approved that could give Flint up to $220 million in federal aid. Though the bill is at a standstill because of Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Senator Lee believes Michigan has enough resources to fix itself. Another thing Congress did was visit the city of Flint and see just how the residents were living during this crisis. Congressman Dan Kildee and 25 of his co-workers came to Flint. The thing that I've been most impressed about is the, what the federal people have done. Um, you've got 70 people um, from VPA, HHS, uh, FEMA, all on the ground and other organizations. Uh, stepping up and showing Americans that when we have a segment of our society that's in trouble, that there are people that are going to stand up for them and try to make a difference in their lives. And the one thing that I leave here clear about is that we cannot allow the flints of the world to become the norm. Congress hit the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, hard for what seemed like not doing their job correctly. The EPA first knew about the water as early as February 2015, though they seemed a bit more occupied with keeping their reputation clean than checking into the problem. That or they were too busy pointing fingers elsewhere, like blaming the MDEQ for not adding corrosion control. But with the EPA knowing so early, people are wondering why they refuse to act. The energy modernization bill that was going to include aid for Flint is now moving through the Senate, though it no longer includes money for the city. Many of the high-ranking members in different agencies that we once believed were there to help us actually made the problem worse. Haley Thompson has the rundown on those people who lost their jobs since the water emergency began. After many government mistakes in the Flint water crisis, it was only a matter of time before people started losing their jobs. The first to feel the heat of the crisis was Flint Mayor Dane Walling. He lost his re-election in early November to Karen Weaver. Next in the hot seat was the DEQ. And the reasons were clear. Specifically, they pointed to a primary failure of leadership at the DEQ, 
This failure was not putting a necessary anti-corrosive in the water, which led to the resignation on December 29th of DEQ's director, Dan Wyatt, whom told government officials that the anti-corrosive was not necessary. And it led to the resignation of DEQ spokesperson Brad Werfel, who told Flint citizens to just relax about the lead concerns. Two others from the DEQ who remain unnamed also paid consequences. On January 22nd, their poor actions towards the water resulted in an unpaid suspension. But the first to actually be fired over the water was former DEQ's head of Michigan's drinking water unit, Leanne Checker-Smith. She knew early on about the contaminants in the water, but made no action to fix the ongoing problem. The DEQ was not the only administration reprimanded for not giving important information to the public. Former EPA Region 5 Administrator Suzanne Hedman resigned after strong criticism for withholding Flint-led concerns. I resigned in part because of the false allegations about me that were published in early January when EPA was unable to correct the record. The EPA was the first federal agency to know about the dangerous amounts of lead in Flint and had not responded for over a year. We're, we're, we're in mid-March 2016 and you still don't get it. You still don't get it, and neither does the EPA administrator. You screwed up, and you messed up people's lives. So far, only six are out of jobs, but the people of Flint and politicians feel that's not enough. And what we've been doing is asking the governor, the state, to be accountable. Uh, I, I know that you've seen there have been some resignations going on at the top level of Michigan Department, and um, these are some good first steps. Last night was the state of the state. Those are some good first steps, but Flint needs more help. Indeed it does. More and more people are becoming upset and feel that two at the top have yet to step down. There's a lot of blame to go around. And one of the points that I have made is that I believe the governor of this state should understand that his dereliction of duty was irresponsible. He should resign. The governor should resign or be recalled, and we should support the efforts of citizens attempting to achieve that. But that is not enough. Many congressmen have called for Gina McCarthy, the administrator of EPA, to resign due to her consistent denial of the EPA's role in the crisis. At the March 17th hearing, she continued to argue that it was the MDEQ's fault and the EPA did all they could. If you want to do the courageous thing, like you said Susan Hedman did, then you too should resign. Nobody's going to believe that you have the opportunity, you had the, the, the presence, you have the authority, you had the backing of the federal government, and you did not act when you had the chance. And if you're going to do the courageous thing, you too should step down. Investigations are appearing all the time and even more are coming. Not only will these investigations hinder the city, but they will also hinder the state. Calvin Phillips and Abby O'Neill shine the light on this story. The Flint water crisis has ruined many people's lives and caused families a lot of pain. And now investigations and lawsuits have started to pile up and people are hoping to be brought the answers and justice that they deserve. It's not a natural disaster. It's a human disaster brought on by failures of humans, but I think as well brought on by failures of government at all levels. The FBI started its own investigation into the chain of events that caused this crisis. And the Federal Bureau of Investigation is not here to help fix the problem. They are here to find someone to blame. They opened a criminal investigation to determine whether or not federal laws were broken. But not only are the FBI involved, federal prosecutors in Michigan are working with many other groups also investigating the crisis. And so the investigations are underway, uh, multiple investigations. The uh, federal government, state government, county prosecutor are all conducting uh, criminal investigations right now. The Flint Water Task Force, created by Governor Snyder, are the first to finish their investigation in Flint in March of this year. The task force found that the MDEQ and former emergency managers of Flint are mostly to blame for this catastrophe. The government for the people of Flint and the EPA are also at fault. It's clearly a case we should learn from this. There was a change in a water source, and I think if you look at the recommendations they talk about, uh, there's more questions that should have been asked, could have been asked, and more work done when you're making a dramatic change like this that I think people underestimate in many regards um, in terms of not just the city but the DEQ. On Tuesday, February 23, 2016, the Michigan legislator built a committee to review findings, examine policy actions that could possibly prevent similar events elsewhere, and take testimony on mistakes that led to the crisis.
Senator Jim Ananick, one of the vice chairs, was not happy that it does not have a subpoena power and openly called it an investigation. This should have happened much sooner. In addition to the other investigations, the EPA was auditing or examining how Michigan enforces drinking water rules and said it would identify how to strengthen the state. On the state level, Michigan Attorney General Bill Schuette enlisted former Wayne County Assistant Prosecutor Todd Flood and former Detroit FBI Director Andrew Arena to lead in another criminal investigation of crimes surrounding the crisis. This investigation led to criminal charges against two MDEQ officials, Stephen Bush, who faces five offenses, and Mike Prisby, who is charged with six. Mike Glasgow, a City Flint employee, also faces two criminal charges, but according to Schuette, there's more to come. A congressional hearing was called on February 3rd of 2016 for the biggest investigation looking into the Flint water crisis. The first round of hearings saw the testimonies of many, but were missing key players, including the governor of Michigan, who was not called to attend. The problem is that today we are missing the most critical witness of all, the governor of the state of Michigan, Rick Snyder. And the Midwest's former Region 5 administrator of the EPA, Susan Hedman. Darnell Early, the former emergency manager of Flint, was also called to attend, but failed to do so. On Tuesday, I issued a subpoena. His attorney refused service. We're calling on the U.S. Marshals to hunt him down and give him that, give him that subpoena. After so much pressure, they all showed up for the second round of hearings on March 15th and 17th. And another investigation was announced on March 11th, 2016, which is being led by the governor himself, Rick Snyder. He called for an immediate, full joint investigation into how the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services handled the public health problems in Flint. In addition to all of the investigations going on, there have been many lawsuits filed, and most are class action lawsuits. Class action lawsuits are lawsuits that allow a large number of people with a common interest in a matter to sue or be sued as a group. Flint residents filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of victims of high lead levels against Governor Snyder, the state of Michigan, the city of Flint, and other city and state officials in November of 2015. Another class action lawsuit was filed on January of 2016 by attorney Valdemar Washington on behalf of Flint residents who were affected by the contaminated water. Its complaints are gross negligence by the city and state officials for allowing corrosive water to come into the city and claims that the officials knew that the water was toxic and unsafe. And what we need to care about is safe drinking water. And attorney Jeffrey Figer joined the mix in February 2016 filing a class action lawsuit against McLaren Hospital on behalf of residents who contracted Legionnaires disease. He alleged that the Flint Hospital knew about the Legionella bacteria in the water for months while patients were exposed to it and many got the illness. The ACLU has also filed a lawsuit to try and make the city and state officials follow federal requirements for testing and treating water to control lead. They also want to have the officials replace all lead pipes without making Flint residents pay. But while there are many people investigating and lawsuits are mounting up, some people in Flint still don't have water. This is a big problem that has not gone away overnight. And with the amount of lawsuits and investigations, it may take years for the people of Flint to overcome it. Amidst the accusations and investigations, it's important to remember that the people of Flint are still suffering. For a few families, that suffering went further than just the water. It meant the loss of a loved one. Members of the Joint Convention, the Governor of the State of Michigan, Rick Snyder. January 19th, 2016. Michigan's Governor Rick Snyder gives his State of the State address amidst the still escalating Flint water crisis. His apologies and promises drowned out by the shouts of nearly 1,000 protesters just outside the doors. The signs beg for clean water, living wages, and answers to dozens of issues. But one family had been hurt in a way that only a few others had. Tanya Von Deneen lost her uncle on July 5th, 2015 to Legionnaire's disease. My uncle recently got a job working in Flint with cleaning up yards that had water in them and were spring water probably from the Flint River areas. And shortly after he did that, he ended up with Legionnaire's pneumonia and a couple weeks later he died. When Brian McHugh fell ill in the summer of 2015, Tanya had no idea his condition was as serious as it actually was. Not at all. My grandma called me. I brought my kids. He's barely breathing and can only say yes and no answers by the time that I get there. Originally, Tanya suspected that her uncle was infected while working in Flint, but after researching and her uncle's past visits to the hospital, 
other questions started to arise. It just made no sense why there was multiple people up on a unit with Legionnaires. But there's a clear connection between the change in the Detroit water to the Flint water and an increase in the Legionella bacteria. McLaren did not go public with news of the outbreak, adding to the list of reasons behind the $100 million lawsuit they are now facing. Since the patients had all been treated recently at the hospital, the disease isn't transferable through air or contact, and McLaren is on Flint water, Brian and the other patients most likely picked up the disease from the water at the hospital. Normally, Genesee County sees less than a dozen instances of people infected with Legionnaire's disease in a year. 91 total cases occurred during June of 2014 to November of 2015, 12 of which resulted in death. So another question arises, why didn't the people find out sooner? Yeah, in terms of Legionnaire's, I didn't learn of that until 2016. And as soon as I became aware of it, we held a press conference the next day. Um, that was clearly a case where the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services should have done more to escalate the issue to get it visible to the public and to me. However, emails released from the Genesee County Health Department show that high-ranking members of Snyder's administration were informed of the outbreak back in March of 2015. Uh, the information was in the highest levels of your executive office uh, 10 months before you knew. Did you speak with them about it? No, I don't recall any mention of that to me, and I don't recall seeing those emails or being part of any of those discussions. So the story turns into a scandal, leaving one of two possibilities that is still undecided. Snyder was telling the truth in his press conference, having never learned of the outbreak until January, meaning that an issue of this importance was overlooked and took lives. The second possibility would be that Snyder did know about the Legionnaire levels back in March, and lied to the media in his press conference and in his State of the State address. Either way, the government had the potential to save lives and decided not to. For families like Tanya's, that choice changed everything. My uncle was everything to us. I mean, he came to all of our functions. He was always there to support my kids, me. He was one of my number one supporters, and now I don't have him in my life at all. And that hurts. At this point, local, state, and federal agencies take blame for the crisis. But they're also taking heat for what's happening beneath the surface and behind closed doors. Did they know that people were being poisoned earlier? And did they fail to act in time? Grant Palmentier and Jillian Berger tell us more. One of the most disturbing parts of the Flint story is that it took outside experts, discredited whistleblowers, and emails to expose the total failure of government that created the Flint water crisis. There's a lot to this story, but let's begin with the Flint mother. Her name is Leanne Walters. My home was being tested because of the discoloration of my water and the health issues my family was experiencing. Leanne said that she asked Miguel Del Toro to come to her home, where he found high elevations of lead within her water. She then went on to say that he was silenced. Mr. Del Toro was told by the ethics attorney to forward all media requests, including those during his personal time. He was also advised not to talk about, about Flint or to anyone from Flint. In a meeting I had with MDEQ, Leanne Schechter Smith bragged to me about how Mr. Del Toro had been handled, that his report was flawed, and that there would be no final report. This was the ultimate betrayal for the citizens. Susan Hedman cared more about policy than the welfare of an entire community while punishing and silencing the one person that was willing to help us. In that memo dated June 24, 2015 to the EPA, Del Toro wrote, recent drinking water sample results indicate the presence of high lead results in the drinking water. The lack of any treatment for lead is of serious concern for residents that live in homes with lead service lines or partial lead service lines, which are common throughout the city of Flint. The MDEQ did everything to discredit Del Toro's claims. Their spokesman Brad Werfel said anyone who is concerned about lead in the drinking water in Flint can relax, and then labeled him as a rogue employee. This is a guy who wasn't allowed to travel. He suddenly had to go to ethics training. He had to do all these other things. That's how Region 5 and the EPA was operating. And the EPA denied they had silenced Del Toro. During the entire time period that Dr. Edwards imagines I was covering up data and silencing scientists, I was actually out of the office. 
In response to the noise becoming created from the case, the city of Flint conducted their own lead tests in March 2015. They came back saying the water was in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. But there were some questions raised about what they had found especially concerning the lead and copper rule. Uh, what's become clear in Flint is they've, they've never followed that first step and therefore, frankly, all of their prior sampling results are invalid. Other concerns raised about the initial testing were the city only collected 71 results when they needed 100 for a city of 100,000. Then the state officials threw out two test results that pushed lead results under the 15 parts per billion requirement. And on top of all this, testers were flushing the water lines before taking test samples. The fact that they hid the contamination and the fact that the lead was spiking in 2014 and they didn't tell anybody and it was through their own tests that they found it. While the city was at fault, the EPA has seen just as much of the blame towards covering Flint up. The EPA not only had silenced Del Toro, but they are at fault for not acting sooner with well-known knowledge. But the EPA continued to push blame on the MDEQ and Snyder's officials, leading to back and forth finger pointing. The crisis that we are seeing is a result of a state appointed emergency manager deciding that that city would stop purchasing treated water that, had, that it had been successfully relying on for 50 years. At the State of the State address on January 19, 2016, Governor Snyder announced he'd release emails from his staff between 2014 and 2015. Since Michigan is one of only two states where the governor is exempt from FOIA laws, they were released voluntarily. About a month later, the governor's office released a second batch of emails from 2011 to 2016. In these emails is where it gets even worse. It's Michael Ladola. He wrote an email on October 14th, 2014, stating, and I quote, The notion that I would be getting my drinking water from the Flint River is downright scary. In another email, which was a briefing to the governor from his departments in February 2015, says that it appears the mayor has seized on the public panic to ask the state for loan forgiveness and more money for their infrastructure improvement, dismissing Mayor Walling's outcry. The briefing finishes with, once the city connects to the KWA system in 2016, this issue will fade in the rear view. In another email from Chris Kalensky of the Michigan State Troopers says, as you know, the governor can declare it any time for any reason, meaning Snyder could have declared a state of emergency much sooner than he actually did, no matter if the city did or not. All of this information brings us to the ultimate question. How could Snyder not have known? When our city council makes a vote in May of 2000, or a, a March of 2015 to get off of the Flint River, and he and the emergency manager turned it down, calling it incomprehensible, there's no way he didn't know. Much of Snyder's staff, including his chief of staff, knew very well of the catastrophe at hand, whether it was the TTHM or lead and now Legionnaires. Is the state government truly that incompetent? Is the governor lying? Unfortunately, we don't know that. There are several simultaneous investigations being conducted by federal and state government with no conclusions as of yet. The emails released, the silenced EPA official, and the overall lack of acknowledgement among all parties in wrongdoing point to this Flint water crisis as not just a mishap, but a full-fledged cover-up. Just days away from our official release of this documentary, DTV had a rare opportunity to speak to Governor Snyder about the latest on the water crisis. We were only granted a few questions, but in this exclusive interview, Snyder spoke about changes in laws, plans to speak to the public, money being used, and his thoughts on the criminal charges. I haven't heard what they are specifically, but we've been cooperating with all the investigations and I encourage them, the investigations to take place. Mm -hmm. And do you have any fear that any of your appointed officials will be anywhere close to that? Well, again, I, I think our people have been working hard um, to address the qu questions in Flint um, and we'll wait and see what the Attorney General has to say. Okay, and Congress members are saying that the state isn't giving enough money right now. And so do you feel as governor that you're giving enough Actually, the state's far ahead of the federal government in terms of the amount of aid for Flint. Uh, we've done $67 million so far. I've got a request in for another $165 million. That's far more than the federal government assistance that's been provided, although we want to partner well with the federal government. All of us should be working together to address the questions and problems in Flint. And your task force asked for changes in the emergency manager law. Mm -hmm. Do you support that? 
Well, again, yeah, that's something I'm always open to about how you can improve legislation. Overall, the emergency major laws worked well, but you can continually improve. And I think there are some good legislative hearings that are looking at those same questions. Okay. And do you think, or do you plan to meet with the people of Flint and, you know, talk to them? And I've been meeting with a lot of people in Flint. I was just in a Flint resident's home this week getting water to drink. Do you plan to do it in the public? Again, I've had public events. i there quite often for the Interagency inter Action Committee. Um, so I'm there many Fridays, most Fridays in fact, to uh, help chair that meeting. There were serious mistakes made from everyone involved in the crisis. Governor Snyder for not knowing crucial facts when his staff clearly did, the EPA for not coming in sooner, and the MDEQ for not treating the water right. But it gets worse. There is blatant disregard shown by Governor Snyder when he hired a PR firm for his staff and himself. And on top of that, he hired a team of defense attorneys being paid for with taxpayer money, $1.2 million of it. The list of disrespect toward Flint goes on. And there continues to be no concrete end in sight for Flint. It's been two years since the switch even happened and Flint's water is still not safe to drink. Only 30 lead service lines have been replaced, with more yet to be even located. The state and city have plans that will take time to enact, but the waiting game is done for the people of Flint. Things haven't changed for these families going through it every day. The EPA and Virginia Tech have evidence that the water quality is improving, but the people's trust is broken beyond repair. Health problems and lawsuits will linger as the national spotlight has begun to fade out. As the nation moves on, the people of Flint are trapped, their city damaged, and their children poisoned. And two years later, this crisis still has no solution. I can feel the poison coursing through my veins With no end in sight, how can we survive when there's lead in the pipes? We're already dead inside I remember the day that the people came, the scary men that said, there's been a change. All of the water I've been drinking is contaminated, before it was just tainted, but now it's toxic. But it's okay, they say, there's no need for me to complain, they've got bottles of water, and right here it says my name, just ration that for now. Go by. It seems that I am running out of time. And the fears start coming true. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? I can feel the poison. Crossing through my veins With no end in sight How can we survive when there's lead in the pipes? We're already you can dead feel inside. the burning If a belly touches your skin As the people sing to the corrupt king Cause there's lead in the pipes We're already dead inside How can this be? Why can't you see? There's people in these homes. They're human beings. At least now we know what little you plan to do. At least now we know the children are expendable too. At least now we know how much we mean to you for 15 years
Baby's got lead in them.